I want to talk about Calvinism this morning. I'm holding a gospel meeting in about a month, and the church there has asked for this topic to be addressed, and, and so I was preparing it uh, for that meeting, but then I got to looking, got to thinking, it's been a long time since we've talked about Calvinism here. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And if, if you've done any study of Calvinism before, then you can appreciate the subtitle I've given this lesson, Plucking Calvin's Tulip. And if you get that, then you, you have studied Calvinism before, and you do understand uh, what we're going to be striving to do, trying to do in our study here this morning. Calvinism is a system of theology that was developed by John Calvin. John Calvin lived during the Renaissance age. He was very much a part of, very active in the Protestant Reformation movement. Now, the, he didn't come up with this doctrine. The ideas that influenced Calvin originated in the writings of Augustine, who lived during a time period when religious leaders were debating the sovereignty of God and its relation to man's free will. Calvinism today is also known as Reformed theology. We seem to be living during a time in which a lot of rebranding is going on uh, regarding religious organizations and religious names. And so Calvinism uh, today is also known as Reformed theology. Few denominations could be said to be fully Calvinistic in their theology. Calvinism is very deep. It is very uh, intense, and so there are a few that hold to all the tenets of Calvinism. Among them would be the Presbyterian Church. I believe John Calvin is credited with being one of the founders of the Presbyterian Church. But the United Reformed Churches in the United States and even the Reformed Baptist Churches would be fully Calvinistic in their doctrine. However... Most churches that are connected with the Protestant Reformation hold to some tenets of Calvinism in their doctrine. Among these would be the Lutheran churches, the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches. Uh, today, even the large community churches or the non-denominational uh, megachurches or, or, or bring in all different kinds of people, churches, they hold to some tenets of Calvinism. They would even extend fellowship to a full-blown Calvinist. They wouldn't have a problem doing that. Now, that is, that is said to make us to understand that Calvinism is a prevalent false doctrine in the religious world today. And because of the large number of people who believe in and promote Calvinistic ideas, that makes it important for you and I to be familiar with Calvinism. We need to be able to know when we are hearing it. We need to be able to recognize when someone is stating a Calvinistic belief so that we know what the Bible says about that, and we can go to the Scriptures and we can show the truth on that subject. Uh, so we need to know about it, number one, because we're very likely to encounter someone who is either Calvinistic uh, or they hold to some Calvinistic ideas. But secondly, because this is such a wide-held false doctrine, religious teachings saturate are saturated with the error of Calvinism. And if we're not careful, Calvinistic ideas can even creep into the church. What do I mean by, by Calvinistic ideas being present in, in religious teaching? Uh, a lot of a lot of brethren have what are called study Bibles. And a study Bible is a Bible that has the text, but then with the text, there are also some notes that are found. And it's not uncommon for the notes in study Bibles to be Calvinistic, to be promoting the false doctrine of Calvinism. I've also found a lot of premillennialism in study Bibles as well. Nothing wrong with having a study Bible like that. You just have to have your brain turned on when you're reading those notes. You, you need to know the book. You need to know the Word of God before you go and you trust comments that are made in some of these study Bibles. Commentaries 
a, a lot of commentaries are written by denominational writers, especially a lot of the older commentaries that the copyright is long since gone and, and they're available for free. Commentaries like Barnes Notes, very Calvinistic. Very Calvinistic. Or devotional books that are written by authors who are popular today can be Calvinistic. Even self-help books. I remember when we were younger, when we were raising our family, a lot of people recommended uh, books by Dr. James Dobson in Raising Children. As I was reading one of his books, he's Calvinistic. He holds to Calvinistic ideas. Of course, today, a lot of these Bible study helps are found online. And so when you go to online sources, maybe you're going to a podcast, maybe you're going to a blog that's online, or maybe you're listening to sermons or watching videos online that have come from denominational sources, there's a good chance you're going to get a dose of Calvinism in those. So, as Christians, we need to know what this false doctrine is. We need to know when we, we need to be able to recognize when we're hearing it so that we know what the Bible says about these false doctrines. Now, I, I mentioned with the, the subtitle, we're, we're going to talk about plucking Calvin's tulip. The five points or the five tenets of Calvinism are represented with the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And these are the five points in our study today. We're going to look at these five points of Calvinism or these five tenets of Calvinism. They are T, total hereditary depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, perseverance of the saints. And we'll discuss what these words mean as we go through and look at these one by one. But and when we talk about TULIP and we talk about Calvinism, we're looking at the five points of Calvinism. So let's pluck this TULIP. Let's go through and let's take a look at these five points. We're going to look at them. We're going to look at what Calvinists teach. And we're even going to quote some Calvinists at times uh, in, in hearing from their words what they believe about these matters. And then we'll look at a few verses with each point to show why they are wrong, that the Scriptures show that, these, uh, that Calvinism is a false doctrine. Let's start with the false doctrine of total depravity. Calvinists teach that because of the sin of Adam that we read of in Genesis chapter 3, all people today are born totally depraved. That is, they are born guilty of sin. That's why Catholics practice infant baptism. It is not just a ceremony for them. They are very serious. They believe that that baby, if it was to die before it was baptized, that baby would be lost. Now, Catholics are not Calvinists, but Catholics believe in inherited sin or total depravity. But Calvinism teaches that because of Adam's sin, we are all born guilty of sin, and more than that, we are born with a sinful nature. We are born depraved. We are born corrupted. We have, inherit we have inherited this sin and this corruption from our parents, and they got it from their parents, and you can go all the way back to Adam. That's what Calvinism teaches. And because of this, all of mankind is depraved, uh, and I, that all of mankind is unable to choose what is right. I want to read uh, regarding this point of total depravity uh, from Calvinists themselves. I got this book a good number of years ago. It's been reprinted a number of times since. It's written by two Calvinists. David Steele and Curtis Thomas. The book is called The Five Points of Calvinism, Defined, Defended, Documented. So if you want a, a very easy, it's not necessarily easy, but it, you can see it's a very short book, uh, a very brief book, uh, but it's going to take these five points of Calvinism and, and give what they believe about, about it, and they give plenty of scriptures, they provide plenty of scriptures to back up what they believe regarding this. Let me read from page 25 of this book regarding total depravity. Originally, Adam's will was free from the dominion of sin. He was under no natural compulsion to choose evil, but through his fall he brought spiritual death upon himself and all his prosperity. He thereby plunged himself and the entire human race 
into spiritual ruin and lost for himself and his descendants the ability to make right choices in the spiritual realm. His descendants are still free to choose. Every man makes choices throughout life. But inasmuch as Adam's offspring are born with sinful natures, they do not have the ability to choose spiritual good over evil. That's what Calvinists mean by total depravity. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about these ideas? Number one, the Bible makes it clear that no one inherits the guilt of sin. No one inherits sin and no one inherits the guilt of sin. In Exodus chapter 18 and at verse 20, through the prophet Ezekiel, God says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. We do not inherit the guilt of sin. We do not inherit a sinful nature. It doesn't work that way. God holds each of us accountable for our own actions, for our own choices. Now, Adam introduced sin into the world. It became a reality, and we have to live in the presence of sin, and we live in the presence of temptation, but each of us become guilty of sin when we choose to sin. And someone might say, a Calvinist might say, you know what, you're going back and you're grabbing this verse, and you're plucking it out of context to try to, to make a point. If you go back to, to Ezekiel chapter 18, you'll see the context here is that the Jews who were in Babylonian captivity were saying, the fathers ate sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And what they were saying is, we are suffering because our fathers sinned. And God was saying through Ezekiel, no, you're being punished for your sin. That's how that works. So we do not inherit sin. Here's something else the Bible makes very clear. God holds us accountable for choosing right over wrong, which means that you and I have the ability to choose spiritual good over evil. And this is clear in a number of verses. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, and at verse 19, Moses says, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Moses was giving them that choice, saying choose life. You have the choice, but choose life. This is very similar to what Joshua said in a passage that's a little more familiar to us in Joshua 24 and at verse 15, choose this day whom you will serve. That was the challenge that Joshua gave to the generation as he was parting. That was his farewell address. Now he didn't say, choose this day who you'll serve. Oh, I forgot. You can't make that choice. No. Both Moses and Joshua said, choose you can make the choice. God will hold you accountable for that choice. Many other passages that we could look at, talking about inherited sin, talking about where guilt of sin comes from, talking about the ability to make choice. How many times does God have to say something to make it true? Once. Once. So this first tenet of Calvinism is proven false by the Scriptures. But these five tenets each builds to the next. And so the next tenet of Calvinism, the letter U, is for unconditional election. What does this mean? Well, since man is totally depraved when he is born, that's what Calvinism teaches. Since man is totally depraved when he's born, it is impossible for him to choose to serve God. There is nothing he can do about his salvation. He is so sinful that only an act of God can make him spiritually minded in any way. Therefore, God must choose the people who are going to be saved. And conversely, He also chooses those who are lost. That's the idea, the Calvinistic idea of election. That God has chosen who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. The word unconditional means that God didn't take into thought our personal belief, 
what our belief would be or what our response would be to hearing the gospel. God's choice is based on His sovereignty and His good pleasure alone. I don't know if you recognize this, if you see this, understand this or not, but the second tenet of Calvinism makes God a respecter of persons. If, if it's up to God to decide who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, then that makes God a respecter of persons. And you know what the Calvinist, you know what the Calvinist would say to that? That's absolutely right. The Calvinist would say, yes, God is a respecter of persons, and we shouldn't have a problem with that. Again, let me quote uh, Steele and Thomas. On page 31 of their book, they say, It is not within the creature's jurisdiction to call into question the justice of the Creator for not choosing everyone to salvation. It is enough to know that the judge of the earth has done right. It should, however, be kept in mind that if God had not graciously chosen a people for Himself and sovereignly determined to provide salvation for them and apply it to them, none would be saved. The fact that He did this for some to the exclusion of others is in no way unfair to the latter group. Yes, it makes God a respecter of persons to which the Calvinists would say, Amen. He is a respecter of persons. He has the right to do that. Well, the problem with that is that the Bible clearly says that God is not a respecter of persons. I wouldn't have a problem with God being a respecter of persons except for the fact that the Bible clearly says He is not. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius to preach the gospel to him. Remember the miracles that took place and the Spirit teaching the Peter? Peter was a little thick-headed, like a lot of us are. But he finally got the point. He finally started to understand. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. Notice, God's, our acceptability before God is based on our choice. It's based on how we respond to God. If we fear Him and we work righteousness, we're accepted by Him, but God shows no partiality. The same thing is said in Romans chapter 2, and at verse 11, there is no partiality with God. Here's another problem with unconditional election. The Bible says that God wants everyone to be saved. The passage we had read for us before the sermon, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not some, not just the elect. God wants everyone to be saved. So remember, the Calvinist has God deciding who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. If it is entirely up to God then everyone would be saved. No one would be lost. A good passage to go with this is one we looked at in our 9.30 hour. 2 Peter 3 and at verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. So this idea that, that God is a respecter of persons, and the Calvinists would say He's, he's sovereignly chosen some to be saved, and, and some are going to be lost, and we shouldn't have a problem with that. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. And that's one of the problems that I have with Calvinism. So this second point, the second tenet of Calvinism the Scriptures show that it simply is not true. And again, lots of Scriptures we could look at here. How many do we need? One. We need one, and that will take care of it. The next tenet is limited atonement. And again, you'll see that these tenets build on each other. If, if man is totally depraved and, and cannot choose to be saved, and God has, has to choose who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, and it's entirely up to God then when God sent Jesus into this world to die on the cross, He didn't send Him to die for everybody. He sent Him to die just for those that He had already chosen 
who was going to be saved, and who was going to be lost. That's what the third tenet of Calvinism teaches. Since God knew He would only save certain individuals, then Christ died only for those individuals. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross was not for everyone, but only those whom God had already chosen to save. How does that set with you? It doesn't sit very well with me. Because the Scriptures teach that Christ died for everyone. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. Hebrews chapter 2 and at verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for the elect alone. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Christ tasted death for everyone. In the book of 1 John, at chapter 2 and at verse 2, John says that Jesus, Jesus is introduced as the subject in verse 1, verse 2, and He Himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation means an atoning sacrifice, or a pleasing sacrifice. God's law says the penalty for sin is death. That penalty has to be met. When Jesus died on the cross, that penalty was met. So He's the propitiation for who? For the whole world. Not just for the elect. Later in chapter 4 and verse 14, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the the Son as Savior of the world. So again, the, the Calvinist says that Jesus just died for the elect. His blood was just shed for the elect. The Bible says... He died for all, for everyone, for the whole world. Have you ever heard the phrase, painting yourself into a corner? Think about it, if you're going to paint the floor, I don't know why you'd paint the floor, but if you're going to paint the floor in your house, you wouldn't start at the door and work your way in. Because you'd find pretty soon you'd paint yourself back into a corner and you can't get out. That's exactly what false doctrine does. False doctrine, if you take it to its logical conclusion, it's always going to paint you in a corner and put you at odds with the Word of God. Because of the first two tenets, then this third tenet has to come along and the Calvinist has to say, no, Jesus didn't die for everyone. God knew who was going to be saved. He decided who's going to be saved. And so when Jesus died on the cross, it was just for those few, just for the elect. And that's what false doctrine does. The Calvinist has painted themselves into a corner. The Scriptures do not teach that. Again, we could look at other verses. How many do we need? We've looked at more than enough. Let's look at this fourth tenet, and that is irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. Remember, Calvinism teaches that man is depraved in sin and cannot choose, cannot choose right or wrong. And so, in order for the elect, the ones that God has chosen to be saved, in order for them to respond in obedience, it requires an act of God. God is going to have to intercede directly with that person so that they will come to faith and they will come to obedience. And He does so through what Calvinists call irresistible grace. The elect are irresistibly called by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when this happens, it is impossible for them to escape being called. Now, I want to read a couple of excerpts from this book to, talk to, to show what they mean by irresistible grace and the role that the Holy Spirit plays in God extending this, this call of irresistible grace. The gospel invitation extends a call to salvation to everyone who hears its message. It invites all men without distinction to drink freely of the water of life and live. It promises salvation to all who repent 
and believe. Now, right there, if we stopped right there, I'd say amen to that. That's true. That's true, but, but the Calvinist continues. But this outward general call extended to the elect and non-elect alike will not bring sinners to Christ. Why? Because men are by nature dead in sin and under its power. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, in order to bring God's elect to salvation, extends to them a special inward call in addition to the outward call contained in the gospel message. Through this special call, the Holy Spirit performs a work of grace within the sinner, which inevitably brings him to faith in Christ. So what's the Calvinist teaching? The Calvinist is teaching that a person can't be saved until the Holy Spirit falls on them and performs a work of grace personally upon their hearts. I want to stop right here. I made the point at the beginning that there are some who are fully Calvinist and there are others who just hold to ten some tenets of Calvinism. And that's the case here. Many denominational people who reject the first three points that we've looked at, they say, no, that, that, that's not true. They accept this point. They accept this point. I know that from experience in talking with family members who are members of the Baptist church. They would adamantly oppose the idea that we're born to pray or that we cannot choose, or, or that God has already chosen who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, or that Jesus just died for a few. They would, they would reject and oppose those doctrines, but they adamantly believe that you cannot be saved. You're saved by faith, but you cannot have faith until the Holy Spirit works upon you directly and personally. What are they doing? Where did they get that idea from? They got that idea from Calvinism. That's where that idea came from. I want to read on. I want to read on about this special inward call of the Holy Spirit. Notice what Calvinists say. Although the general outward call of the gospel can be and often is rejected, the special inward call of the Spirit never fails to result in the conversion of those to whom it is made. For the grace which the Holy Spirit extends to the elect cannot be thwarted or refused. It never fails to bring them to true faith in Christ. And there's where that term irresistible comes in. When the Holy Spirit extends that call, it never fails. What does the Bible say about this? I don't know about you, but, but when I read these statements, I have some immediate problems with them. Number one, the Bible says that the gospel is God's power to salvation. In Romans chapter 1 and at verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The Calvinists would say what the gospel can be preached and preached and preached, but until the Holy Spirit acts on somebody, it will not result in conversion. And the Bible says this is the means, this is the instrument that God has chosen to save mankind. So we've got Calvinists saying one thing and we've got the Bible saying something else. What about the idea that the Holy Spirit cannot be resisted? Turn with me to Acts chapter 7. When Stephen is making his defense before the Jews, he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. The Calvinist says the Holy Spirit cannot be resisted. The Bible says he can. He can be resisted. So, what does Romans 4 teach us? Let God be true and every man a liar. When man says one thing and the Bible says the exact opposite, what are we supposed to do? Who are we supposed to believe? The Bible takes care of this matter. And let's look at this fifth tenet. How about the perseverance of the saints? Again, each of these points builds on the other, and it makes the others necessary. 
The idea of the perseverance of the saints is that if God has chosen to save an individual and has sent the Holy Spirit upon them and caused them to believe and to obey, then the child of God can never do anything to cause himself to be lost. If God has saved someone, then God is going to keep them saved by his power. And it doesn't matter what that individual does, if that person is saved, they can never be lost. They are kept in the power. They are preserved by the almighty power of God. This is the very popular once saved, always saved doctrine. Many people that we know believe in this. Well, it comes from Calvinism. That's where it comes from. Those who believe in once saved, always saved, they get it from Calvinism. They, they are accepting a, a point of Calvinism. Now, I want to make this point. When we look at, at the, 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 the theory of Calvinism, when we look at the five points of, of Calvinism, I, I said that there are some who embrace it all, and there are some who, who embrace just some of it. But I want to show you that, that, that you can't do that. You simply can't pick and choose which ones you want to accept. If you decide that you're going to believe in irresistible grace, that you're going to hold to that doctrine, or you're going to believe in perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved, then, then you're choosing to believe in something that is built on to a doctrine that you've already rejected. In rejecting one tenet of Calvinism, you have to reject it all because each of them are connected. You can't have irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints if you've already decided that there is no total depravity, unconditional election, or limited atonement. If you do away with any of them, you do away with all of it. So, perhaps keep that point in mind. If you're ever studying with someone and they want to believe in once saved, always saved, well, perhaps take them and show them where this doctrine has come from. Where does this doctrine come from? It's come from a, a system, it's come from a theology that you admit is wrong. You admit that it's wrong. Why would you hold to these last two points? Calvinism stands or falls as a whole. And we've already shown that it falls. It falls. So what about perseverance of the saints. Well, we do not have the time, we do not have the space on this slide to show the number of scriptures found in the New Testament that warn of the danger of apostasy and the imperative of remaining faithful unto the end. The book of Hebrews as a whole exists for that very purpose, to show people that they must remain faithful or they're going to lose their salvation. The book of Galatians is in our New Testament for that very purpose. But so many of the epistles contain admonitions and warnings against the danger of apostasy. But again, as we've been saying, how many scriptures do we need to show that something is right or wrong? We need one. And I think the best one with once saved, always saved is Galatians 5 and verse 4. Galatians 5 verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You to attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. To become estranged from someone means you're separated from someone. You can't be separated from someone, estranged from someone that you weren't once with. They were once with Christ. They once had fellowship with Christ and now they're separated from Him. And what's the result? They have fallen from grace. Calvinists will tell you in this book right here that if a Christian falls from grace, they never had grace. You can't fall from something you never had. I use the illustration all the time. The only way I can fall off the roof of my house is if I get up on the roof of my house. The only way anyone can fall from grace is if they had grace to, believe, to begin with. And this verse plainly says, you have fallen from grace. The verses could be multiplied, but this one is enough. This one is enough to show that this last tenet of Calvinism falls 
just like the rest of them do. This is a lot. We've covered it a lot today. You talk about gazelle speed. We have flown through Calvinism. Each of these points could be one sermon in and of themselves. So there's a lot more here to dig into and to study if you're inclined to do so. But if you've, you've taken notes and you've written down these verses, these verses will do. They will equip you, they will arm you as you're studying with individuals to show them what the Bible really says about these important points. Calvinism really has to do with man's salvation. But it's a false doctrine. It's going to lead to man's condemnation, not to man's salvation. And we want to stand for the truth, and we want to help people to understand what the truth of the Bible really is. Let me wrap this up by making these points. Calvinism does not scripturally reconcile God's sovereignty and man's free will. Remember, that's what Augustine and the people of his day were trying to do. We know that God is sovereign. We know that he's all-powerful. But then we know that man has free will. And how can those two coexist at the same time? Well, Augustine and Calvinism came to the conclusion they don't. Sin removes man's free will, and you just have the sovereignty of God. We've shown the Bible teaches that is not true. Calvinism does not defend the honor and the majesty of God. That's what Calvinists believe that they're doing that they are upholding the sovereignty of God and the majesty of God. I want to tell you, Calvinism makes God into an unloving, sadistic, cruel monster. There's no way around that. Calvinism turns God into a sadistic, cruel monster. How can you say that? Revelation chapter 22 and at verse 17, one of any number of verses we could turn to to make this point. The Bible closes with a glimpse of heaven and an invitation to come to it. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirst come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Bible extends the invitation for, for heaven to everyone. Whoever wants to can come to heaven. But if you're not one of the elect, you're not getting in. You want to serve a God like that? You want to serve a God like that who, who says, who has His gospel preached in all the world, who says that, that heaven is for everyone, that the gospel is for all, that anyone could come if they just want to, but no, you can't. Think about that for a while. Spend some time thinking about that for a while and see if that doesn't turn God into a cruel, sadistic monster. It does. Calvinism appeals to those who are lazy, spiritually lazy. What do I mean by that? When I was going to college, one day each semester, the Gideons were allowed to be on campus and they handed out their little Bibles. I don't know if you've ever gotten a little Gideon's Bible before. These little bitty New Testament and Psalms. And I remember I, I got mine on that day and I went into a big lecture hall and I was sitting down and, and a couple of students were sitting down behind me and, and I heard them talking. I heard them, I heard them going through the, those Bibles because the sound of those little tissue thin pages, you, you can't mistake that. So he, he's, he's thumbing through this little testament that he got and I'll never forget, he says to his friend, you know, it says in here somewhere that God's already decided who's lost and who's saved, so why bother? And he put it away. Why bother? Calvinism would appeal to a person that doesn't want to bother. Again, look what the doctrine says. You and I can't be accountable for ourselves. God is in control. So, if God's in control and I can't make the choice myself... Let's eat and drink and be merry. That's all we have to do in this life. And God to decide if we're saved or lost, and that would be the end of it. It's a false doctrine that appeals to those who are spiritually lazy. And it is a false doctrine that, as we said, is very prominent. And so as Christians, we need to be careful that we're not influenced by Calvinism. And while we might never be tempted to believe in inherited sin or total depravity or that God chooses individuals who are saved or lost or that Christ has shed His blood only for the elect. 
I do encounter more and more Christians who believe that the Holy Spirit operates directly and personally upon them. And where does this belief come from? It's come from Calvinism. And it's come from Pentecostalism. It's not come from rightly dividing the Word of God. And although we would deny once saved, always saved, I meet more and more Christians who live as if they believe in it. So we have to be very careful that we're not influenced by this false doctrine of Calvinism. Let us be content to stand upon the Word of God and let us take seriously the admonition in Philippians 2 and at verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Thank you very much for your kind attention to this. And again, we've gone through it very quickly. If you've got any questions, I'd be glad to talk with you and, and address those questions you may have. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, not yet a child of God, forget about Calvinism, and let's go to the Word of God. Let's see what the Word of God says. Jesus Christ died for you, and the gospel is preached for you to hear and to respond to. And if you choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, based upon the evidence found in the Scriptures, then you're compelled to respond to that. To respond in obedience, by repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being baptized to have those sins washed away. And that, that's something that you want to do. You can do that right here and right now. If you've done that in the past but become unfaithful, God holds you accountable for that. Maybe you need to make things right in a public way. Maybe you need our prayers for strength or encouragement. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?